Well, how are you? How are things in Salt Lake City? Oh, I'm wonderful. Things are uh, are cold, but not as cold as they could be, I suppose. It's uh, it's like, what is it, 54, 55 degrees here today, which is not awful. It's been in the right. 30s for the last couple of months, so yeah. 50 feels, feels all right. I just yeah. got back from uh, going and seeing Caligula's horse down in Phoenix, and it was like 76, 77 degrees down there the whole time, right. walking around in T-shirts, feeling like life is good. And, and then you come back home. Okay with the place that I live, because it's a good place for the most part. Yeah, yeah. Have you lived there pretty much your whole life? Um. Yeah, kind of. So I was born in Northern California. Uh, in like Humboldt County, the Redwoods area in Northern California. But I, my family moved here when I was, I was less than 10 years old. I was probably like seven, eight, nine, somewhere around there. So I have essentially been in Utah most of my life. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I'm here in Arkansas. And you're in uh, is it Arkansas. Arkansas. Yeah, cool. yeah. So it's, uh, it's about 60, give or take, uh, maybe a little nice. either. 60 to 65, somewhere around right in there uh, today. So not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, could be a lot worse. Nice. So, uh, of course, when uh, when it gets cold here, it's just sort of that sort of a very humid, wet cold. So it's yeah, not- miserable, biting cold where exactly. if there's even the slightest wind, it doesn't matter what jacket you're wearing. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, in, a few years ago, I uh, I guess it's been about five years. I think it was exactly five years ago, actually. I gave a um, I gave a lecture at a university in um, London, Ontario, and I was thinking, yeah, because you know Canada in February, that's where you want to be, right? And uh, <laughs> I got up there, there was snow on the ground, but uh, but it was actually really nice because it it didn't have the 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 yeah, wet cold is. like what we have here. So uh, my wife and yeah. I actually really enjoyed the trip. Uh, it was nice. a lot. Of fun. Yeah, so we we uh, we yes. enjoyed it, and we were kind of going. So this is what real snow is like. We just get out, <laughs> you know. So it was a it was a whole yep. different experience for us. Oh, and ice is ice is a whole other ball game, man. Like when you're when you deal with these ice storms where the ice sheets cover the road and cover the power lines and cover everything, it's crazy what yeah. you guys have to deal with out there when you get those get those uh, gnarly storms. Yeah. I really enjoy the weather here in Utah for the most part, even in the winter when it's cold, like I'm a snowboarder and I love going up in the mountains and really taking advantage of the snow that we get. It's, it's fun to go. It doesn't like, it does snow at my house, but the snow will melt. So I'll get a foot of snow at my house and then it'll melt within three days. And then it's no snow for a couple of weeks and then it'll snow a little more. But all I have to do is drive 30 minutes up into the mountains to 9,000 feet elevation. Mm -hmm. And there's 10 feet of snow piled up on all the buildings. It's, it's really epic and amazing to be so close to such a cool natural wonder. It's, uh, It's awesome. As I've kind of communicated with you, as we were getting ready to release the Emerald City Council album, uh, we did the first single back in uh, the beginning of December. And uh, of course, Neil already released it on Waterfall at that time. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were kind of going like, we want to see where we where we stand up and we want to, um, you know, like what's going on, you know, what's everybody listening to. And of course, you know, I keep up, you know, pretty well with, with what's happening in Progressive Rock World. But I started looking through some of the you know, here are the top 10 of the year. Here's, you know, from all right. the podcasters, you know, because there was a, a million and four of those, the, the top 10 of 2023. And so I started looking for the albums that kept popping up on multiple ones. Uh, then yours kept popping up with Advent Horizon and and uh, downloaded it off of Apple Music and um, put in the put in the AirPods. And uh, when I finished listening, I just had a smile on my face. I was like, man, this is, this is really great stuff. And- So I just wanted to kind of talk about, you know, like, you know, how do you go about writing, writing this album? And, uh, you know, how, how did this all come about? I mean, I know you, you, this is not the first Advent Horizon album and everything, but uh, what do you think made this one different? And and how did you approach writing everything on it? Yeah, um, man, that's, that's a, 
that's a real long story and i have to think about where i want to begin in the in the epic saga that is advent horizon right. um because this is advent horizon is the first band that i ever started when i was 15 years old wow. um my my drummer and i uh we actually started playing drums and guitar together when we were like 12 or 13 uh, on the same day his parents got him a drum kit my parents got me a guitar for christmas and we both said let's play music together and right. we you know we jammed for a couple of years and then we started advent horizon and it's just been this rolling presence in my life ever since then that tends to ebb and flow like we'll get really passionate about it we'll write an album and then we'll do other things for a few years and then we'll come back and get passionate and then do other things so the first two albums pretty much follow that cycle where we got excited we released an album we did some shows and then we disappeared for a year or two or three um <laughs> but the difference with this album um is that we we reached a point back in about 2017 because we had been hitting it pretty hard for a few years with the band. We had released Stagehound. We had worked really, really hard. We had done a bunch of opening spots. Uh, we we opened for like Leonard Skinner and for Kansas and for Foreigner and for Warrant and for we did all these like one off opening shows. We toured the U.S. a few times. We were working so hard. It was basically a full time job for us, but as you being a songwriter in a small band as well will understand there is just no money in original music these days right. and we were we were busting our butts for years trying to figure out a way to make a living with it and we got really discouraged and we um in 2017 ish we decided you know what let's just stop trying to make this a career and think of it more as a passion project yeah. Um, and just let it take whatever course it naturally takes and we'll find other ways of making money elsewhere. And that was a really good decision because it it opened our minds to rather than thinking about like, let's try to make songs that are catchy enough that they might have some mainstream appeal potentially, it changed us from that mindset over to what would I want to listen to if I was a listener listening to Advent Horizon. Um and it, so it it kind of let me write songs the way that I would want to hear them, which that's kind of a weird way to say it. I'm trying to think yeah. of a better way to describe it, but hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I get it. Um, yeah, so we we allowed um, we allowed ourselves a lot more uh, one time to make things. We which it took i mean that was in 2017 we didn't release the album until 2023 so that's there's a long gap right there we we yeah. allowed ourselves many years to let the ideas kind of ruminate and grow naturally um and then in about 2021 ish was but by about 20 the end of 2020 early 2021 that's when we had all of the songs fully written uh and ready to go actually no i'm sorry end of 2019 early 2020 timelines are crazy because covid and all of our right, brains are right, scrambled right, and it's yeah. hard to think of the, the recent years but um that's around the time when we said okay we've got enough material written here let's start recording an album um but going back to what you said about like songwriting why this album is different it's really just that that we allowed ourselves to write music that we would enjoy listening to and um, for me, that meant spending a lot of time as a songwriter just experimenting in my studio at home. And that's part of the beauty of modern music production, right? Is that we have everything at our fingertips. You know, right. you can, as long as you've got Pro Tools or Ableton or Logic or whatever, and a MIDI controller and an interface and some guitars, you can kind of do anything these days. Um, and so I spent so much time like hundreds and hundreds of hours just locked in my basement experimenting with stuff coming up with little 30 second ideas i've probably got close to 150 to 200 pro tools sessions on my computer of little snippets of ideas you know it's like it's like one minute long or a minute and 30 seconds just enough to like here's a verse and a chorus of a song and then i would bounce that out send it to the band and say hey what do you think of this one and they'd either say "Eh, you can do better or they'd say hey there's something cool there let's expand on that and that's kind of how we created the album 
Okay. Now, um, just one one of the things that um, when I was looking at uh, what you're doing, so when I was listening to it off of Apple Music, um, you know, and it has the lyrics there, you know, that you can access. And at the end, it said, you know, written by Riley McDonald. But when I got the vinyl, which I happen to have here, by the way, just came in the other day. Hey, but, look at that. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. Great stuff. And it sounds sounds wonderful on vinyl. Uh, um, I'm, I'm a big Sweet. vinyl collector and, and love that experience of, you know, sitting down with the artwork and the lyrics and everything. So, yeah. Uh, but it said that um, it says in the liner notes here that the songs were written by you and my your drummer, right? So, mm -hmm. so uh, what was the process with the two of you working together, and and who did what, and or did it change from song to song, or um, how did so that? It, all it it does change a little bit from song to song, but uh, by and large, the process is I will come up with a basic framework for a song. Um, you know, kind of a, an arrangement with verses and choruses. I'll have the basic hooks for the choruses and stuff in there. Um, and I will produce it to the best of my abilities. I'll have full MIDI drums in there and kind of a full a full mock-up production, if you will, of the song. Right. And then I will send that over to the band, which usually results in Mike coming back to me and calling me and saying, hey, man, I've listened to this six times. Here's my thoughts. I think that the chorus of the song is great, but you need to change this specific line. I think that you do this cool little instrumental thing between the chorus and the bridge right here. Why don't we expand on that instrumental and make it more? So Mike is kind of, um, the best way to put it is he's quality control. He helps me determine what is what is worth keeping, what is not worth keeping, and what needs to be expanded upon in the songs. Okay. So yeah, so he is a very active participant in the songwriting, although it is me that I'm the one that does most of the actual writing and he is more of like helping to guide me to make the songs what they can be. I guess if you think about it that way, Mike's almost more of a producer role right. um, yeah. in the project, but he does also help write lyrics. He comes up with like a lot of rhythmic hooks and lines and stuff. So I... I, it, when I was writing out the credits for the album, I had to think real hard about how to credit him. And I eventually decided I'll just put him in as writer because that's the easiest way to encapsulate it. Right. So what would what's a normal like writing session for you? When Do you have an idea in your head? Do you sit down with an instrument and start or, or in Pro Tools and start just seeing where the moment takes you? Or, you know, what? how do you get the ball rolling with, with writing something new? Um, obviously it's going to be a little bit different song to song, but I find that in general, when I say, when I say, okay, I'm going to write a song right now, ready, go. Those are the least productive writing sessions for me. Those are the ones that, that end up just feeling forced. Nothing in the song feels natural. Um, for me, the vast majority of our good material I, are the songs that come to me just on a whim like I'm I'm just you know I'm in the shower and just thinking and just like uh, thinking about life and contemplating things and then this song idea this lyrical idea will pop in my head and then the lyrics will form a melody and then I get out of the shower and I get dressed as quick as I can and I run downstairs and record a demo of it or I'm on a long drive I do a lot of thinking and writing while I'm on drives because I spend a lot of time driving to and from gigs right. um and uh, and that's fairly common for me to come up with a, a melodic idea. I tend to write melodies before I write everything else, um, which I think is a little backwards for a lot of prog bands these days. I know a lot of prog artists will write like a guitar riff and then they'll put a melody on top of it. I tend to be reversed from that where mm -hmm. I hear a melody in my head and then I will compose the chord structure and the riffs underneath that melody after I've written the melody. But I have in my phone's voice memos, I have so, so many uh, voice memos of me in the car and the voice memo will just, you can hear the road noise in the background and I'll hit record and I'll say, okay, so this is going to be roughly 130 beats per minute. It has a, I'm hearing a, a chord progression going from A minor to D to G. Uh, and then over the top of that chord progression, I will sing the following melody and then I'll proceed to sing the melody. And then weeks later, I'll go back through my voice memos and I'll find that one memo that I made in my phone and go, oh, 
Yeah, I think I remember what I had in mind for that, and I'll I'll try to produce it out. I've written several songs that way. Um, so like I said, it kind of changes song to song, but I would say the um, the most important factor is uh, is inspiration needs to come naturally and not be forced. Right. If you were the one asking me that question, I would have said virtually the same thing you said, uh, which is oh, really cool. Awesome. Uh, the majority of, of my writing takes place, like I said, driving a car in the shower, um, at the gym, maybe walking laps. Um, anytime right. that I'm sort of alone with my thoughts, you know, uh, something comes to mind and I usually try to have everything worked out in my head before I ever sit down with an instrument to figure out what it is that I'm hearing. And, um, when I do on occasion sit down and try to just, you know, uh, see what pops out. It's always terrible. It's always like, oh no, you know, yeah, that's not gonna work. Now, you know, there is every once in a while that I I have the I have maybe the the verse and the chorus worked out. I know what I'm gonna do for an intro or whatever, and I need to come up with a bridge, and I already kind of know what you know the harmonic language of of the tune is. So um, sometimes I'll sit down at, at the keyboard and and come up with um, with a bridge, you know, there on the spot that works. And uh, right. sometimes I'll do that. But uh, as far as yeah. just like the, you know, I'm going, like you said, anytime that I ever say, mm -hmm. I'm going to write a song today, uh, it, it never turns out to be anything good. <laughs> it always comes, it sounds very yeah. contrived. And the other thing that I find yeah. too, which is interesting, um, is that when I do sit down, and I'm sure, uh, I'm assuming you do, you do most of your, you know, kind of, kind of figuring out on guitar, I'm assuming. Um, whereas for me, yeah, it, I'm it, definitely it, a guitar important. driven guy. Right. Well, you know, there's certain patterns that just come more natural to us. And I find myself relying on those a little bit too much when I try to do that, you know, going, okay, this chord, it feels good to go to this chord. And so it ends up being just, I feel almost like if I'm trying to just go in the moment that I'm sort of limited by where, where my hands naturally want to go as opposed to going where the melody wants to go. And so I think that that um, is almost like, you know, kind of hamstringing myself in coming up with, with original ideas with it. Uh, I'm a professor of music. I don't know if I've mentioned that to you uh, or not, but, um, and I actually have been uh, just started recently working with some students who want to write songs and I've been doing some composition lessons with them and, uh, and having students come in with just like the lyrics first and say, um, you know, we want to, I want to put music to this. It's like, okay, well, let's work on it. Let's try to do it. Have you ever had to try to to do that, work with the lyrics first and try to work your way backwards? Um, not with an Advent Horizon song, but I do uh, a, a fair amount of production for other people, friends of mine, and also like local artists that that want me to help them produce out music. And that does happen from time to time where people will will come in with words and say, hey, let's make something out of these words. Um, it's you're right. It's challenging. It's very challenging when you're used to working the other way around to try to just look at words, especially if you didn't write those words, um, because when you write words you write out lyrics you as the composer of those lyrics have a rhythmic scheme in mind for those words so you already have an idea of what the rhythm how the rhythm is going to fall how they're going to be uh presented but when you didn't write them and you're just reading someone else's words i find that it's hard a lot of times to get yourself into that mental space that they were in when they wrote them and you end up perceiving them differently than how they intended them. Uh, so it can be a challenge for sure. And I mean, challenges are good. It's good to flex your muscles songwriting wise. And I, I think it's always good to um, to try as many different avenues as you can for songwriting because you never know when you'll find some new thing that happens to be your new favorite way of writing a song. Right. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's challenging for sure when you're not used to that. Yeah. Did you do anything in in writing the songs for uh, a cell to call home? Did you did you do anything where you sort of challenged yourself and say, "I'm going to try to do this sort of thing that I've never done before"? Was there anything along those lines? <clears throat> so yeah, we for the song "Water," mm -hmm. I wrote that piece 
piano intro thing with the chords under it first. That was the that was the first thing that I composed for that song. But I wasn't sure of where to take the song after that. And Mike's suggestion for it was, well, why don't we, if the song is called Water, we already knew we wanted it to be called Water. Why don't we write the song as if it was an ocean wave where the song starts out slow and it builds to a climax in the middle and then it almost reverses itself out of that climax and kind of comes back to its ch so almost it looks kind of like a like a sine wave almost mm -hmm. um and that's we that was our challenge for ourselves and also not just in like the 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 dynamic of the song but also in the structure of the song in that we didn't want to have a chorus that repeated it we didn't want it to have a verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus structure we wanted it to be to be more like this structure where the 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 arrangement of the song reaches this middle point where if there is a chorus the chorus only exists in the middle of the song symmetrically and then it falls back down from it and uh, so the song is essentially a collection of verses with a couple of repeated things in the middle, mm -hmm. um, and it, which is different for me because I tend to, tr I try to write songs with choruses. I think that uh, as a songwriter, I just, or rather as a listener, I uh, I really love choruses. I think that just having a good hook in a song that a listener can return to and make them want to repeat listen to that song is important. So it was different for me to think of it in such a way as uh, to try to force myself out of that we need a chorus, we need a hook mindset mm -hmm. and just allow the song to progress in whatever way it naturally progressed to maintain that water wave shape. <laughs> Um, so that one was pretty fun. Um, I will also say that the other one that was a little bit challenging to put together was the song Control, um, which that song was the last song that we wrote for this album. I wrote it just a month or so before we started tracking the album. And that one I wrote entirely in Pro Tools with MIDI plugins. There were no guitars on that song originally. It was all synthesizer plugins, sequencer plugins, organ plugins, Rhodes plugins, piano plugins. It was just these stacks of plugins that I had kind of uh, created this soundscape with, with the electronic drums and everything, and then the vocals over the top of it. Um, and it was very interesting trying to take that idea that in its original form sounded very, it was almost like a Radiohead song at first, the way that it sounded, and try to take that and then expand on it and also main keep the original structure that we had, but turn it into an Advent Horizon song with real drums and guitars and all of that stuff. That was, that was a challenging process. Um, and the end of that song, uh, it ends, the last minute and a half or so of the song is just one repeating riff that cycles over and over with the saxophone solo over it. Mm -hmm. um, originally, my intention with that riff was to build a soundscape over it, uh, or rather like a, a dramatized, uh, like screen written almost, like uh, like acted out, um, scene essentially because in the story of the album that moment right there is the climax of the story that's the most intense point of the of the story um, from like a, a, a dynamic perspective um, it's where there's like this big fight between this couple they they finally have it out and they are they're screaming at each other and they're they're fighting and they're throwing glasses across the house and they're stomping around and they're getting really angry at each other. And and I wanted to create a dramatized scene with voice actors acting out that that whole sequence. And, you know, you're hearing things being thrown and doors being slammed and all that. That was my original intention. Um, but we ended up deciding in the end that it would be better to create a uh an 
a, an instrumental approximation of that where the instruments are the ones creating that chaos and that argument. And that's where the guitar solo, or sorry, the saxophone solo going back and forth with the guitar ended up creating that argument, that dynamic, that chaos. Um, so that was a challenging song. It went through a lot of phases and a lot of different forms before it reached its final version, but I'm super happy with the result. I really like how it turned out. And so the, the album is a concept album. And where did you come up with it? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, did you have that in mind from the beginning? Or were you, um, were, did that just sort of develop after a couple of songs? Or how did that come about? So in its infancy, um, back in 2017-ish, uh, I was spending some time with my cousin, who is a great guitar player, and he also plays drums, and he plays keyboards, and he's a singer. He's kind of a multi-instrumentalist, and he also has just this really, he has zero musical training, but he has this amazing natural ear for songwriting and for melody and stuff. And so he and I were spending some time in my studio together, just jamming and coming up with random ideas. And we together, he and I, came up with the uh, the framework for what eventually became the song A Cell to Call Home. And so we wrote the intro together, the verses together, the chorus together. Um, he helped me write a lot of the lyrics. And the lyrics that we wrote for that were, um, were based off of uh, a family member of ours who is very distant relation from me, but closer related to him who uh, who struggled with drug addiction, um, going through the cycles in and out of, you know, relapsing and then trying to pull himself out and then leaning on family and leaning on friends and using all the resources he had, but still just struggling. Um, and he eventually ended up passing away of an overdose. And this, uh, my my cousin was very, I think, affected by that whole situation. And he wanted to write something that that could uh, kind of t not directly tell the story, but almost like a tribute to the story, like talking about the struggles of addiction and and like the mental side of working through all of that. And that's what that's what started us down this whole rabbit hole is that that process of writing those lyrics for Cell to Call Home, the song. And then from there, we said, well, hey, why not expand this into a whole album? And uh, at the time, he and I did not realize this would become an Advent Horizon album. We just wrote this one song and then tried to start writing other stuff. And then eventually he and I kind of like split ways and he moved out of state and we kind of lost contact with each other. But in the process of all that, I picked up that song and that concept mm -hmm. and brought it to Mike. And Mike said, hey, this is awesome. Let's turn this into the next Advent album. And that's when Mike and I started really seriously working on turning it into an Advent album. That was, it's a, it's a concept album. It's not, not directly, it, it's not an exact recreation of the story of this distant relative of mine. But like I said, it's, it's kind of like a, it loosely follows this story of somebody who's struggling through addictions and how those addictions and his, his ups and downs of his life interplay with the relationships he has both romantically and with family um it's uh so it's yeah it, i would say it's a concept album but it's a little more complicated than that in that it doesn't yeah. there's not a very solid story that i can tell you line by line what happens right right you know on the first two or three listens of the whole album i noticed that uh angel eyes kept coming back around in multiple songs that that phrase came about and I kind of thought well that can't be a coincidence that's got to be uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> that that's got to yeah, be so, you know, very intentional tying tying things together for sure so angel would be the character in the story that represents his um his he he perceives her as his savior the the woman who he meets who helps him pull himself out of his hitting rock bottom and she is the one that he views as the reason that he is alive and he places her on this pedestal 
But over the course of the album, as their romance develops, as their relationship develops, he starts realizing her flaws and that she is just as human as him and just as susceptible to uh, to giving in to temptation and to taking the wrong path. And those those uh, those realizations drive a wedge in their relationship and end up creating this conflict that eventually kind of collapses everything for him. So yeah, I'm gonna. I feel like I'm gonna listen listen to it again with uh, with you know a little better understanding. And... You're the primary writer for Emerald City, um, but I'm curious as to, I've told you all about the relationship that I have between me and Mike and the rest of the band and how our songwriting uh, strategy fits together, but how does it work for you guys? Is it similar where where you're writing the majority of things and then other band members are just giving input here and there, or is it more collaborative? Like, wh where do you guys fit? So ultimately, um... I guess, um, I don't know that there's a good way to say this without me sounding like I'm some kind of dictator or something, uh, but but just because of the, it, it's mostly just because of the way that we, we work. So this particular project, keep in mind, I started out being, um, this was going to be a Brent Bristow album. This was not going to, I had no idea that we were going to form a band called Emerald City Council. Right. Jake came up with the name. Uh, like I said, until Casey said you guys should start a band, I had no idea we were gonna we were gonna even do that. So um, pretty much with the songs, I pretty much have them planned out, plotted out in in Pro Tools, and so most of most of the demos are, as I said, are usually pretty bare bones. And um, and I probably should do more. I actually have. Uh, been learning guitar a little so that I can add in some rhythm tracks and some things like that. Uh, when I could, I'd get one of the guys, uh, Seth or Philip or, or whoever, to come in and do uh, a rhythm guitar track just to, to flesh it out and give Noah something a little bit more to work with. But like with Ice Thinning, it was mostly just me just banging on piano. Uh, I had MIDI tracks for, you know, the guitar licks and stuff and, and everything. So, so it was pretty bare bones. And so I would send it to Noah and, and tell him, this is what I want. And we would have a conversation about it. When his schedule allowed, uh, he would send me back a video of him practicing it. And I would say, change this, change that. And now we allow the joining of hands and new beginning rise to devise a passage across the ice city. The structures of the song were pretty much the way that I set them. We never really discussed anything like that. Um, but there were times that with with all of the guys that they would sort of say, I think that this part needs to breathe a little bit more, or I think this part needs this or whatever. Uh, we need to add some harmonies on this. We need to do this. And, um, and I did, you know, I, I have to admit that I did kind of dig in a little bit to start with. And Casey said to me, and I don't even know that I've even said this to Jake. But Casey said to me at one point, he said, uh, well, you know, one of the things that you need to remember is that you you approach things very sort of academically because of your background. And Jake approaches things more viscerally. And he said, and I think that if you guys meet in the middle and find the place where you guys are both happy, that it's going to be really fantastic. And so um, so I had to let the range loose a little bit on, in, in some places uh jake would probably say not not enough but uh but yeah so the way that it typically worked was i would put together the i would map it out with a real bare bones demo with me doing a scratch vocal um and then if seth could come in and do some rhythm tracks he would do it i would send it to noah uh we would talk about what i wanted he would add the drum stuff we would flesh out some more guitar stuff send it to jeremy for the bass then uh would go to um We'd go to Jake for vocals and then it would come back and we would finish out, you know, the last guitar stuff. And then I would add all my parts, the key sax, backup vocals and everything. 
um, the the alto recorder track, you know, all of that stuff. So I would add those in, uh, you know, as you know, after that. So, so yeah, so th there wasn't really, you know, as far as the structure and everything goes, that all pretty much, uh, everything pretty much stayed the same from how I envisioned it. There wasn't really much there, but I think everyone would sort of take a little bit of ownership of their individual parts and say, I really think here, you know, it, in, in a few places, you know, so I think everybody has their individual stamp on a few spots here and there uh, to make a little bit more. Now, moving forward, um, Jake is a fantastic songwriter. And as I said, this was originally going to be a Brent Risto project. So I wanted to do an entire album with my material the way that I wanted it done. And now that I've done that, I want to start including Jake more in, into the writing process because he is a fantastic writer that we need to utilize. And uh, and then also the other guys, I want to be able to say, hey, if you've got a cool lick you want to do something with, if you've got an idea for something, let's talk about it and see if it's something we can incorporate or see if it's something we can turn into something. And so so I'm hoping that move, moving forward, we're going to be functioning a lot more as a band, for sure. Cool. Cool. Well, that makes sense. It's, it's definitely not super far off from my experience um, that you... I think you and I are fairly similar. I obviously have less uh, less of a theoretical background and I'm not an academic person per se, but I am also a very, uh, controlling sounds wrong. That sounds like a negative word, but I I like to main, to feel like I'm the one guiding things in any any musical situation that I'm in. I, I, I naturally tend to take the role of the of the the uh, project manager if you will for wow. everything that we do as a band um and so i very much relate to that like i i create a song and sometimes it's hard when you write a song and then you show it to other people and then you have them record their parts it's hard to hear their interpretation of wow. what you wrote and not want to correct them and say, hey, actually, this note was supposed to be played like this. Yeah. It's it's something to that I've had to learn how to let go and to say, just because something isn't exactly the way I heard it in my head originally doesn't mean it's inherently worse. It could be better. And I'm just having a hard time viewing it objectively because I'm so used to what I heard. Yeah. You know, yeah, um, exactly. so yeah I, I definitely relate to what you're saying. And I, I want to try to be more collaborative with Advent Horizon writing in the future, especially now that Kaysen, uh, Kaysen has been historically our bass player since he joined the band like 10 years ago. Um, but Kaysen has in recent years become a fantastic piano player, keyboard player. He's gotten really into collecting vintage instruments. He's He purchased an old uh, Hammond B8 organ a couple of years ago that he's fully restored himself. Uh, he got uh, he bought an old Wurlitzer. He's got an old Rhodes that he purchased. He's got all sorts of synthesizers. He's got Prophets and he's got Junos and he's got all this stuff. And so with all this wealth of knowledge he's gained in recent years, I really want to try to put that to use in writing new Advent Horizons yeah. stuff. Because like you mentioned earlier, I am a guitarist. I write music on guitar and that I mean, that is a part of why our music sounds the way that it does. Our our songs are all guitar driven songs. Any you like fast forward through an Advent Horizon album and listen to any random moment, and you will always hear the guitar as the most prominent instrument, or almost always hear the guitar as the most prominent instrument. But I'm not opposed to leaning more on synthesizers and on pianos and stuff if there if there are cool things that that can be done with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I think that was something that I, and I hope it comes across, maybe it doesn't, but I hope it does with, with our album, was that I wanted there to be songs where the guitar is 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 driving it. There's part, you know, Mortal, Mortal Game is more piano driven, at least in the first half of it. Um, and then there's some that are acoustic guitar, some that are electric guitar, some where uh, the organ is is doing the stuff more where the sax is kind of motivating things. So I wanted it to be a, a varied, you know, that you weren't feeling like uh, this song sounds like that one or whatever. Um, well, I 
one thing that I have to say about your album after listening to it again this morning, because I messaged you a little bit about it yesterday, but then I listened to it again this morning before, in advance of our call. And yeah. something that really stuck out to me is that the the piano playing is great. It's it's very well done. All of the organs, all of the keyboard parts are very expertly executed, but oh. there isn't any point on the album where to me it sounded like a piano player wrote this music. It's it, it didn't lean so heavily on that instrument that that instrument dominates the soundscape at any yeah. point. Like it was actually impressive to me how uh how how like laid back the piano is in the mix a lot of the times. Like you really do allow the guitar to sit forefront in the mix and most of these songs um it, which is impressive that's cool the, hearing music written by a piano player on piano that features the guitar louder than the piano in a lot of sections is very cool well to be fair i'm a saxophonist who plays keyboards <laughs> okay fair enough and the sax was very prominent in the sections that yeah, it stuck out yeah, so yeah, yeah. uh and and what i tried to do with the sax as i've talked about in a few other places is that i wanted it to be a very non-jazz sax approach um, one of the things that that I hear a lot of times is um, when when you hear a lot of great jazz players or a lot of a lot of great players I should say that play in um, in you know rock stuff a lot of times it sounds like they're trying to sound like Dave Sanborn or something like that and <laughs> right. that's pretty cool but I, I just felt like I wanted to do something different I've spent a lot of my career playing classical music and I wanted to incorporate that um, element of things and also I'm very influenced by you know, Robbie Steinhardt's approach to playing violin in Kansas, and I wanted to incorporate that as a saxophonist. And uh, and also, you know, some of the stuff that I'm doing where I'm um, I'm using, um, actually using the uh, the same MIDI guitar software that um, that Paul uses when he's playing with Carl Palmer's band. So I'm playing sax and my live sax is triggering synth. So it sounds like, so it's a nice. double in there. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, and so, so I'm using some of that to try to expand the sound a little bit more, you know, so you hear that in, in some places in there. Uh, but I just wanted it to be, um, you know, and, and I think some people have picked up on that. Some people have kind of gone like, I, I've i never heard a saxophone sound like this, to which I'm going, that's kind of what I was going for. That's the goal, right? Yeah. But, but I do, but I did love that when Casey, uh, when he first heard Noisy Talking and he said, if someone had told me that this song was written by a saxophonist, I would have said there's no way. But I wonder, I think you, you like, so you said you started playing guitar at 12 um, mm -hmm. and, and Mike started playing uh playing drums shortly after that. So when did you guys start writing songs? Uh, immediately. Like we 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 wrote songs, I mean, w within a week or so of starting to jam together. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted to write music. Wow. And of course, the for the first couple of years, our songs were just terrible. But we spent a lot of time just coming up with ideas together. And we would... Um, we learned together. Uh, so we were very, very basic at first. Like we would start saying, let's learn Highway to Hell from ACDC today. And we would just learn the ACDC song. And then we would use what we learned from that song to try to write something new using those techniques. Um, and we, we worked, we graduated probably too quickly because we were very full of ourselves from ACDC to Rush. And then we went through Rush albums and we would every day we would get home from middle school. So we would have been in eighth grade or whatever at this point. Um, yeah, eighth grade ish. We would get home from middle school because we went we lived in the same street. We went to the same school. We'd walk home from school. We would lock ourselves in his bedroom and say, what Rush song are we going to learn today? And we would learn, you know, we'd start out easy. We started out with things like Working Man and Fly By Night and stuff. But we very quickly progressed to where we were learning, you know, the camera eye and natural science. And then we were learning hemispheres and the fountains of Lemneth. And we, we would learn full rush songs and we would play them through start to finish. Um, and I would try my best to scream like Getty Lee and destroy my voice in the, in the, in the process. But this, these are the things that I think uh, make 
music exciting to a 12 year old right like it's so it's so interesting to think back to those years because at the time I was just doing what I thought was interesting but now I look back on it and go that is so cool that we as 12 13 year old kids instead of wanting to hang out and go to the mall with all of our friends we were excited about locking ourselves in a room and learning rush songs um now all of our all of our peers in school thought we were the biggest nerds we didn't have any social life we did not have a lot of friends but we thought we were cool and we were confident in what we were doing and i i'm proud of that i think that's uh that's something to be proud of so we wrote a lot of music in those days songs that just got discarded but the first actual advent horizon songs that became songs that we would put on advent horizon albums were written when we were probably about 15 16 that's when we really started writing things seriously um we did an EP when we were like 18-ish, 17, 18 years old, that it was just four songs, all of which uh, were later discarded. So they're not songs that we that are on any albums that you'll find on Spotify or whatever now. Um, but that's like our first actual collection of recorded songs in a studio was when we were like 17-ish. And then our first actual album that you'll find on Spotify is Immured, which we released in 2011, which is when we were, I think we had just barely turned 20 when we released Immured. So we re we recorded it when we were 19, released it when we just turned 20. Um, and the earliest songs from that album were written when we were, I believe, 17 or 18, just right at the end of high school. Um, so like graffiti, I'm pretty sure graffiti off of Emirate is the oldest Advent Horizon song that can be found publicly now. That was when I was 17. I might have to go back and check that out. So, is, is Yeah, the, it's very different. <laughs> is the EP available anywhere? Uh, the Sorry, the EP you said? Yeah. So um, the EP prior to Immured is not currently. Um, I do still actually have some CD copies of it. I have like 40 copies of the original CD, which I have long since lost the masters for it. I don't have the tracks. I don't have any of that stuff. Yeah. But I do have like 30 or 40 copies of the physical discs still. And I think I might let them sit for a few more years and then eventually re like, un you know, release like 20 of them on Bandcamp as like, a special thing that people can buy um but uh but yeah so immured which has graffiti on it that's the that's the oldest thing you can find from advent horizon um and it's very different listening to it i went back and listened to immured like two or three months ago it was when i was adding all the lyrics for all of our songs to spotify and apple music i had to go back and listen through the album and make sure the lyrics were all right um and it's it's cool to hear like a a a 19 year old version of yourself you know 13 14 years later um and think about what frame of mind you were in when you wrote it um but i am i'm proud of it like we've grown a lot since then we're obviously a very different band now than we were but i do think that album still sounds like advent horizon like it sounds like it sounds like something I wrote. And that's that yeah. I think is cool. Like we have we have a sound, even though even though the timbre of our music and the production of our music changes and the instruments that we use might change, mm -hmm. it still sounds like our our musical voice. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I have to go back and check that out. I I did get to uh, pick up or or downloaded a stagehound recently and started listening yeah. to that. I need to need to go back and dig a little bit further. Uh, much like you, uh, you know, Jeremy and I, along with Doug that I mentioned, uh, we had um, we recorded with our band Alliance, which is very different from anything we did with Emerald City Council. And uh, yeah, much like you, we still have, uh, except I still have 600 CDs, you know, sort of because <laughs> unfortunately, right about the time that we finished that, and we get we uh, and we did record about half an album after that before everybody officially went their separate ways, but. Uh, Doug ended up moving to Iowa, and we we uh, never really got to play live and go out and promote it and everything. Uh, but yeah, very different. There are some parts that I sort of cringe at here and there, but but I wouldn't change anything because it's 
you know, it's where, where we were at the moment. Which you guys have a gig coming up soon. Now, is this the first Advent Horizon gig since the album has come out? Uh, yeah, this is the first Advent Horizon gig since 2017. Wow. Um, we, yeah, it was like I told you earlier in 2017 when we decided, hey, let's just let's just let this be a passion project. Well, what that meant is we stopped gigging with this band. We right. we uh, we decided it would just be a, a, a virtually existent band only where anything we do is studio sessions and releasing music online. And at that point, we made this conscious decision to not play any more live shows until there was a demand for us to play live shows. Right. Um, because at the time we were we were playing a lot. We would play we were playing almost every month in Salt Lake City for years. We were touring all over the place. And it's really hard to to keep performing over and over and over when there's just not like there were people that wanted to see us, but there weren't enough people to demand us playing 12, 13, 14 gigs a year in Utah. Right. Um, and so we just said, let's just let's just wait and see how things evolve naturally. And initially, I wasn't even sure, even as of a year ago, I wasn't sure if we would do any live performances for this new album. Um, I just wanted to wait and see how the demand built. Uh, I had, I had no idea i had no way of knowing whether this album would do well or whether you know i, I didn't know whether we'd have five people listening to it or five thousand people listening to it i just i had no frame of reference i had nothing to compare it to um and so we just even as of like eight months to a year ago we were saying well let's not plan anything until we see how the album is received Right. And now that we've had a chance post-release to see all the positive reviews and people purchasing the album, and we've got a distributor in the U.S., and we've got distributors in Europe, and we've got people messaging us from all over the world asking when we're going to be playing, it's it's something that we've never experienced before, having so much interest in our original music. Right. Um, and that has been... Uh, extremely inspiring to us right. as as musicians to to see interest globally in what we're doing that's the best thing honestly i've ever experienced as a songwriter or as just a musician in general is you know seeing people interested in what we're doing so yes with all of that interest we decided you know what let's let's put together a live show and about 4 months ago we started getting together for the first time um in doing basic rehearsals figuring out in order to accurately recreate these songs live the way that they sound on the album we would have to either have like nine band members or we'd have to cut things down dramatically and do very pared down versions of the songs or the alternative, which is what we ended up doing, is saying, let's stick with the five-piece lineup of the band, do everything we can possibly do live, and then delegate the rest of whatever we can't do to backing tracks. Extra vocal harmonies, if there's extra like sound effects stuff that you hear on the album, those will be in backing tracks. So we've spent a lot of time the last four months or so figuring out what is going to be performed by each band member on stage. I've gone, it's a whole rabbit hole I've gone down. I've literally built spreadsheets for each song, itemizing out each band member section by section. It's like at 12 seconds, Grant does this. At 17 seconds, Grant switches to this. At 27 seconds, Grant sings this specific harmony part, starting on an A flat. At, you know, It's like going through in detail every song I've made uh, guide tracks for every musician in the band. I've gone through the Pro Tools sessions and like highlighted the sections I want each person playing and made, you know, uh, uh, minus tracks for them to listen to. Um, it's been a massive undertaking, but all of that work is done now. And we're now to a point where the songs are sounding awesome. They're sounding almost, it almost sounds like you're listening to the album when I, we've, uh, I don't know if you saw like 20 minutes before we started recording this video, I just posted the first live video from our practice sessions. Um, and it sounds 
it sounds like it's amazing how close it sounds to the album and it has me so excited to recreate these lives so I apologize. This is the longest answer I could have ever come up with to your question. But yes, we do have a show coming up on April 19th. It is our, we're calling it the album release show. We're six months late for that, but uh, we're calling it that anyway. (laughs) Um, And yeah, and there will be more shows to follow. I have promoters in several different markets around the country that are interested in booking us at venues. Um, I can't say which markets yet because I don't want people to get all excited yeah, and then yeah, us yeah. not have the show pan out. But we've got we've got probably four to six shows that we're working on right now uh, around the U.S. and hoping that they all pan out for this year. Right. Um, but the first one is that Salt Lake City hometown show just to that shows almost a proof of concept for us just to put it all together on a stage with the production, the way that we want it. We have our own sound engineer, our own lighting engineer. We'll have a a light show programmed to the music. Like everything is, it's like this controlled environment where we can make exactly the show that we want in our local environment with our local fans. And it's going to be a fun night. I'm excited for it. Yeah. That's exciting. If, if it wasn't, you know, a two day drive for me, I would, I totally come up for that. Uh, yeah, St. Louis, we've done that drive before. It is not it is not a short drive. A little bit of what what you did of course you know our album has only been out for like a month like five weeks exactly mm-hmm. exactly five weeks today and uh and it's just been incredible seeing you know the response and everything was there a moment for you guys when when you realized oh this is this is being very well received was was there one moment or was it just a, a several things together or when when was the um, moment that you that you sort of sighed or had a sigh of relief that you know okay we're we're doing well here? Um, I'd say it was not so much one moment, but rather a collection of moments that that overall created this uh, this feeling of confidence that that we had done something that was good, you know, that people were liking what we created. Right. Um, and there, you know, there's some, some key moments in there, like the first time anybody ever did a YouTube reaction video to our album was so exciting to us. Um, and now we have, I think there's probably six or seven YouTube reaction videos to the album now out there. Like it's like every month or so someone else will release a reaction video and it's been so much fun to see those. But that first reaction video was like mind boggling to me that somebody would, somebody would take the time to do that with our music was so cool to me. Um, There was also uh, when Prague radio um, picked up our album and they, they did a review and they reviewed it. They they do that like yak scale that I'm sure you've seen it. And they, they reviewed it five out of five yaks. And it was one of the first reviews that we had that was a full album review, not just a review of one of the singles we had done. And it was so exciting to me to get this like five out of five glowing review from a reputable source. Yeah, um, yeah. And from there, it kind of just like spiraled like the uh, Kevin from Prague Radio sent our uh, sent our album off to a bunch of different people, including Rowie from the Prague Report. And Rowie checked it out and then Rowie contacted us and said, hey, I just want to let you know I really like what you guys are doing. This sounds great. And Prog Report featured this. So it's like it's this this cascading like progression of things that happened that got us increasingly more and more excited over, over what was happening with the music. Now, granted, we are still a drop in the bucket compared to where, of course, we'd like to be, right? Um, I mean, we look at... You look at all the bands that we love, Porcupine Tree, and for me, like I love Haken, I love Lapras, I love Caligula's Horse, I love Devin Townsend, I love you know all these all these other bands that I love. I'm watching these guys release albums, and get you know hundreds of thousands of views on their videos and thousands of comments and people sharing their music everywhere, and it's uh it's it's fun to see it, of course, but it's also like humbling because we feel 
I get feeling so like proud of myself and all my accomplishments. And then I see Haken release a new video and go, oh man, I'm nowhere. Like I've got, we've still got so far to go compared to where we are today. Yeah. Um, but that's good. It's good to, it's good to have room to grow, but to also feel that ray of hope that, oh, maybe we can get there. Like we're, we're experiencing enough success now that I feel like there is a chance we could actually take this to that next level. Right. Right. It's interesting because it, hearing you say all those things is like, we're, we're like right behind you. It's like, we're following right in your footsteps. Uh, right. Again, that could have been me saying that, you know, uh, well, Prog Radio gave us a five, five yak review and we were like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And then Roey at Prog Report said, yeah, we're going to do a review for you guys. And so it's like, it, it, it's almost like everything you mentioned was almost step-by-step step what we've gone through in the last five weeks. Well, getting back to the songwriting stuff, um, I, I wanted to ask you, do you have some formal training? Do you, have you studied music theory or, you know, what, what's your background in that? Uh, yeah. So I don't have any like official training formally. Uh, I took my, so my, my grandfather was a, uh, vocal instructor and professor at Humboldt State University in California for about 30 years. Okay. And so at a young age, when I was in California at three years old, my grandpa spent a lot of time with me and he came to my parents one day and said, did you know your kid has perfect pitch? And he had been doing all these like tests with me and like teaching me at three years old, like this is what a C sounds like. This is what a B flat sounds like. This is what, oh, like no he was kind of teaching yeah. me all the notes and the, in the intervals and stuff. And they had, um, he, he showed my parents um, this, he said, hey, you got to come see this. And he had me at three years old, turn around facing away from the piano and he would play a note and I would tell him what that note was. And then he'd play a note, you know, a random interval away from that. And I'd tell him what that note was. And from, and at that age, at three years old, that's when my grandpa said, you've got to train this kid. You've got to get him lessons. You need to foster this. Yeah. And so I took piano lessons for several years until I was six or seven, probably. Um, but I hated it. I had no interest in it. I did not want to play music. I did not want to play piano. It was a drag for me. I hated doing the recitals. Um, and eventually, I think my parents decided to just stop pushing me too much on it and just let, if I was going to be interested in music, let that grow naturally rather than pushing me into it. And so I I had you know some early piano lessons and a little bit of basic theory knowledge from a young age there. Mm -hmm. um, but then I dropped it and I didn't touch music at all from age probably seven until about age 12. And now during this time, my mom is a classically trained piano player. And so I would spend a lot of time at home hearing my mom playing Chopin and Debussy and Rachmaninoff and Beethoven and all this. So I was hearing, I was hearing complex classical music all the time, but I wasn't as a child interested in doing that myself. And my dad is also a classical guitar player. And so I'd hear him playing Segovia and stuff on his nylon string guitar. Um, so I, I was surrounded by it, but not interested. But then at age 12, my dad took me to see Rush, at, which was my first like real rock concert. Uh, sure. We saw them, it would, so age 12, I believe it was the R30 tour that he took me to see. So this is like 2004 or something, something, 2003, 2004. Um, and the, that concert like it awoken something in me, like I, I, watching those three guys on that stage at age 12, seeing them just rocking out and having the time of their life and then seeing people in the crowd, seeing thousands of people singing along every word, air drumming the drum fills, air guitaring the guitar solos, like seeing the excitement from that crowd just really inspired me. And that was the day that I said, I want to play guitar, dad. And then my dad bought me a guitar. My friend Mike got his parents to buy him a drum kit because I got Mike into Rush shortly after that concert. And then right. that's where it all started. But since then, I've had no, no real musical training. I've never taken any professional guitar lessons. I've never taken any theory classes. I know 
very i literally the music theory that i know is what i learned when i was three four five six years old so it's very rudimentary basic like i can read the notes on a staff i can pick through a sheet of music if you give me two hours to do it but that's about all i can do i'm i'm pretty much a hundred percent by ear with everything i do yeah well yeah i didn't realize you had perfect pitch uh jeremy our bass player does as well oh uh, cool and I, and I envy you guys so much <laughs> for, for well that. Um, I I will say, um, I my grandpa said this kid has perfect pitch. He said that, but over the years, I don't know. Like, I know so many people who say they don't have perfect pitch and yet have better note recognition abilities than I do. And like, I I've come to feel like I I don't I don't really know what perfect pitch is anymore because there's so many people who who have such amazing relative pitch that they may as well have perfect pitch. Right, right. And then for me, if I spend a lot of time not playing music and not thinking about it, it's like a muscle and it it, it weakens. And I find myself having to work myself back into it. It's not just this thing that I'm able to pull off all the time. So yeah. I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's, it's cool to have a really good ear and to have the ability to hear a piece of music and play it back within five minutes. That's a cool ability to have, but it's also a crutch as a, as a performer. Um, because there have been so many times where I'm writing a song and I hear something in my head and I'm going, I know what I want this to sound like, but I don't have the theoretical knowledge to understand what it is that I'm hearing in my head. And it's too complex for me to just pick out. I'm hearing stacked chords like Steely Dan voicings, and it's too many notes for me to, for my ear to pick it all out. But if I had the theory knowledge, I would be able to go, oh, cool, that's this chord layered on top of this chord. You know, it's like, I, I feel like I've used it as a crutch too much for too many years. And there's a part of me that does really want to dive into theory and actually learn more. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I have a doctorate in music. I've been through about a dozen theory classes, plus numerous music history classes that in, involved a lot of theory. And I still hear stuff in my head when I'm writing songs and going, what is this that I'm hearing? So, so what I'm hearing, uh, yeah, exactly. But maybe it never so, ends. Maybe it's hopeless yeah, no matter what. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and there are people that, that, you know, that I know have, have, you know, uh, much better ears than I do. I've, you know, I've been toying with the idea of doing a video of, uh, for our channel, uh, because it's, it's really interesting to me hearing some people's takes on music theory and, um, uh, and, uh, and Jake and I have talked about it quite a bit. And, uh, so it's, it's interesting, um, kind of, you know, hearing, hearing what people think about it and think about what it is. And so it's, um, you know, I think sometimes I feel like, uh, when I've talked to some people and they say some things, I sort of think like, Maybe there's a misconception here. So I've thought about kind of doing something uh, along those lines. Uh, yeah. Would probably just end up like causing an inter internet fight or something like that. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? So, anytime, you, any, anytime you talk too much about like, uh, knowledge of theory or songwriting styles. There's always going to be somebody that disagrees with you right, that wants to tell right. you the opposite is true. It's, I mean, that's just the internet for you. Yeah, but. exactly. Yeah, well, there, there's always going to be someone. Yeah, it's uh, well, and that's the reason why you know I wrote Platforms of Illusion, is a 20 minute song about social media and being on the internet. Is you know you you go on to some of these progressive rock sites and post, hey, who are some great new progressive rock bands that are out today that I need to be listening to? Within five posts, somebody's going to say Gentle Giant. Within, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, which I love Gentle Giant, but they broke up in 1980, you know? And so, you yeah, know, for sure. they're new and current. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so the, there's always going to be that. And, and then there are people who are going to say, progressive rock stopped in 1982 or whatever. So, oh my gosh. Interesting. Well, well, yeah, and it's... I feel like specifically in progressive rock, that's a whole can of worms because oh, I, yeah. oh my gosh, we did, we did some, um, some Facebook and Instagram advertising for some of the singles from our new album. And we got a lot of comments, hundreds of comments from people. We, you know, the ad would basically be just on Instagram, like a 30 second video clip of us performing one of our songs. And under the ad, it would say like, like fresh new progressive rock song, check this out. But I did a bunch of focus testing. And in some of the ads, I said, check out the freshest new progressive rock. And in some of the videos, it said, check out the freshest new progressive metal. 
and just to see like which one does better because i didn't know exactly what to call us we're like heavier than a lot of progressive rock bands but we're not as heavy as a lot of the metal bands this weird in-between spot mm -hmm. and it was like mind-boggling to me how many comments on the prog rock one said this isn't prog rock this is prog metal listen to yes and jethro toll if you want prog rock but then simultaneously how many ones on the posts on the prog metal how many comments on the prog metal post said the exact opposite? This isn't prog metal at all. This is wimpy prog rock. This sounds more like yes than it does like we, whatever. It's yeah. nobody can ever agree on anything. And it's uh, it's kind of crazy, um, right. especially in a genre like progressive rock that supposedly prides itself on being inclusive and boundary pushing and experimental and allowing people to explore dynamics and sounds and genres within that one genre like it's amazing how exclusive people get within and like protective of the name of that genre almost to a point where it like defeats the purpose of being called progressive rock anymore yeah and you know you mentioned yes and it's crazy how many people who you know if you uh, like it You'll see this. Yeah, I'm sure you probably have seen this. Is someone will put a post where they're like, um, you know, happy birthday to John Davidson, uh, lead singer of Yes. And I've been a fan of, of John mm -hmm. Davidson since he was working with Glass Hammer. And yeah. uh, and so, yeah, uh, and people will, will go on and, and go on a rant about how it's not Yes anymore and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And I just want to be like, I think you misspelled happy birthday. Just tell the guy happy birthday. Yeah, right? <laughs> how, hard, how hard is it to, to do that? Uh, you know, whether you're yeah. a fan or not, tell the guy happy birthday. It's his birthday. Don't, you know, why try to start yep. it? <laughs> and so, yeah, it, oh my it's, gosh. Uh, it's yep. amazing for me that, that, that there, uh, that there are so many people who feel like they have to so strongly do that. And that's the reason why, uh, the the third section of platforms of illusion the the inspiration for that was i thought of the line i, I knew i was doing this thing about social media and i was actually thought i was done i'd written all the other sections and then i had this line in my head of uh i must tell a random stranger how incorrect they are and everything and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's a great line and it, and everything else just sort of you know immediately kind of came after that Uh, you know, Getty was an was an inspiration to me. Get when I saw Getty, I saw him on Roll the Bones. You know, that was my first Rush concert. Was on the Roll the Bones tour. I got into him when, when I was in college, and um, the I happened to be. I found out about the concert way late. Had to drive four hours to get there, and uh, I mean, way late when the tickets were on sale. I found out like a week week before it was on. So I was almost behind the stage with where okay. you know, in the arena. And so, like, right in front of me was Neil. And so Getty was sort of, like, I was almost kind of looking at Getty's back. And I could see oh. him switching back and forth between bass and keyboards and all the stuff that he was doing. And I was kind of like, that's really cool. And I've never had an interest in playing. Uh, well, you know, when I first started playing in bands, I was playing sax. And I ended up standing there half the night. Yep. And... And I was bored to tears and I got to where I started dreading doing gigs. I love playing, but you know, it was like, okay, this night just drags on. And I had no interest in being in a horn section for that reason. Right. And, uh, and I also wanted to sing and do some other things. And so um, I, I started, I had an opportunity to join a band where they wanted me to play sax and keyboards. And so I basically had been through some, uh, some basic, uh, piano classes, you know, in part as part of my college uh, training, and so they said, "Can you play keyboard?" And I said, uh, "Yeah, sure, yeah, no problem." And so, sort of figured it out as I as I went along. Uh, but I've always, you know, hopefully, well, I'm going to knock on wood. Hopefully, when you see us live, what you're going to see is you're going to see me playing keyboards with a sack still strapped around my neck, and then a keyboard mm -hmm. as I want to step forward and then come back. And so that's sort of right. always the way that I approached it was that I don't like just standing there for two thirds of the song. And so my, my keyboard playing was really to contribute, um, you know, when I'm not playing sax, 
is kind of kind of. What I think that's a big contributor to why uh, rock bands that incorporate saxophone have such a hard time keeping saxophone players in the band because they're that that problem. The sax players don't really feel like they're actually a band member. They feel like they're more like a hired gun that's just showing up to play their parts and leave. Right. Um, we've had that. We have a Pink Floyd tribute act that we that we put on here in Salt Lake once a year. And we've had a hard time over the years keeping saxophone players interested in playing with us um, because they love playing the parts that they play. But in a three hour set, they're only playing on four songs or, you know, five songs or whatever. And then they're just sitting around backstage the rest of the time. So your idea, your solution to that is brilliant of, oh, well, of well. actually becoming an active participant in the show full time with keyboards, with vocals, with whatever else you can add. That's great. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that I that I tried to do, which um, which hopefully hopefully I pulled off, is that because I did approach playing sax differently, because if you're if you're doing the standard, you know, playing sax, like I said, doing Sanborn licks or whatever, um, or even or even doing you know Boots Randolph or who you know whoever you want to talk about, um, it's not going to fit in every song. And so I tried to modify what I was playing enough that I that I put it in these songs that you ordinarily would never hear sax, and I think it works. Uh, now you may think differently, but I wanted to to show people that you guys are taking this instrument that we have and you're limiting it. You're 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 making it do this one particular thing, and whether you like my approach or not. Um, whether it's whether it's your cup of tea or not, I hope that it will at least open somebody's eyes that, oh, maybe we can do more. And what I would love to see, what I absolutely love to see is I would love to see uh, some more saxophone players going, well, that's cool, but what if I built on it and did this? And then, you know, get a whole other generation of saxophonists doing something different that hasn't been done before in rock circles there's a lot that can be done with our instrument that nobody's doing. And that was one of the things too. I said, well, nobody else is going to do it. I guess, I guess it's going to be me, we'll do it. Uh, you know, for, for, for better or worse, you know? Nice. Yeah. I love, um, I think the thing that not being a saxophone player and not knowing the first thing about how any brass or wind instruments work, I've never even tried to play a saxophone in my life. But as just a passive listener, the thing that I love about saxophone is that to my perception, it is the instrument that most closely mimics the human voice. It's it's as close as I've heard to the expressiveness of what you can do with your voice. And I love that. I think there's it's very dynamic for that reason. Well, right now, the spirit of Adolf Sax is smiling upon you because that was exactly what he was trying to do when he designed the instrument. That oh, cool. 100%. Awesome. I did not realize that. Yes. That's great. That was, that was his exact goal. He wanted to create something that closely mimicked the, uh, you know, the human voice and was. And, and he did it. Yeah. And he did it. And so, uh, yeah. And, and it's funny if you ever go back and not to not to go down this rabbit hole or anything, but if you go back and uh, sometime when, when you have a minute, you know, if you're, uh, you know, in a waiting room for something or whatever, Google Adolf Sax and look up his life because there were so many times starting when he was like two years old that he should have died, that he ate rat poison wow. and fell out of like a three-story window or something like that. And I mean, numerous times that anybody else, you know, probably would have, wouldn't have survived and he survived every single time. So it's almost like the saxophone was meant to be. You know, his, his calling that's like yeah, yeah. Exactly. i mean can you imagine the music world without the saxophone can you imagine can you imagine super tramp if saxophone didn't exist right, right exactly right well even you know early rock and roll going back i mean you know yeah. rocket 88 with the big uh you know jackie brinston sax solo or or little richard you know with some of the stuff that he right. did and so yeah it would it would be uh the landscape would be very all of the 80s of course would have been different you know duran duran would oh, yeah the great oh my gosh, I can't imagine Duran Duran without sax. I mean, just oh, slap yeah. bass all the time. I guess it'd still be kind of cool, but the sax is like the cherry on top. Right. Or even King Crimson, you know, I mean. Yeah, with, oh, for sure. With, uh, you know, the very beginning, you know, 21st century schizoid man. I mean, wow. Yeah. I mean, that was, that, 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 that to that, me was, was uh, revolutionary when I first heard that. I mean, and I heard it 
you know, 20 years after it had been, been out and was like, whoa, wow, that's, that's incredible. So. Hello, did I catch you? What I'm really impressed with uh, from hearing you talk is that, you know, you and Mike have been together for, you know, what, 20 years? 20 years, 20, 22 years from what, if you're talking from the beginning of the art. Well, we're, we're 32 and we met when we were 11. So okay. yeah, it's, it's 21 years now that we've known each other and 20 years, I believe it's 20 years this year since we started playing guitar and drums together. Yeah. That's yeah, that's, that's really amazing. Uh, so a friend of mine, Philip Moore, I've known him since second grade and he's been a country songwriter in Nashville for years and the very first band that I played in was, was with him and some of our other friends and uh, he was actually the one who introduced me to Noah. He did sort of a guest spot and he plays acoustic guitar on the second track uh, the Realize Part 2 but he knew my dad really well and when my dad passed away I got all of his instruments and uh, he was a bluegrass player he was really into bluegrass and stuff and so uh, so uh, Philip was driving back from Nashville and we were going to record and he called me and he said hey I've got an idea. Tell me what you think about this. Um, I think it would be really cool if I recorded the track on your album on your dad's Martin. And uh, oh, and that's cool. a way that he even thought of that. And so so it's very yeah. cool that that uh, Philip, being one of my oldest friends, is playing acoustic guitar on it. He's playing my dad's guitar, which is very wow. cool. So, uh, but yeah, I just I love knowing that about you guys that you have that history that you have that long history there because that's that's always been one of the things that I've loved about you know reading about you know some of my favorite bands is the longevity and everything and it always kind of like it's a little sad when you hear about bands that you know did such great stuff and now they don't get along anymore and you know don't right. want to be in the same room or they get they go in the uh the the rock hall of fame and one guy doesn't get invited because he's going to get invited. you know it's it's ridiculous yep. you created this great thing can you not get along you know a little bit better not so, just yeah appreciate the beauty of what you made and i think there's a lot of stress that especially when you get to that level of i mean if you're if you're being inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame it means you had a very substantial career right and when you get to that level of success um there is so much stress that comes in there uh, as far as the the logistics of keeping a band, keeping your relationship a friendship instead of a business arrangement, right? Yeah. Um, when you start talking about like licensing agreements and who holds the rights to songs and who gets what percentage of of the profits and all of that stuff, uh, it it really kills the the uh the friendship quickly right mm -hmm. uh if you're not careful and we're we're lucky enough that we haven't got to that point yet we we haven't ever had a situation where there was anything truly stressful in our relationship as far as who gets treated fairly yeah. um but it, i do think a lot about if we get to that point where um where we're where we're touring the world where we're actually making some decent money off of royalties from our music when we're doing if we get to a point where we're doing sync sync licensing stuff and licensing out our songs and all of that uh it weighs heavy on my mind the importance of being fair to everybody involved and treating everybody like family not like a business partner um that's that's i think that's where a lot of bands go wrong yeah. And I mean, maybe that's naivety because I have never experienced it. Maybe that's just me observing things from the outside and making an uninformed guess as to what happens. But I feel like people think too much about about uh, their bands as a business enterprise and not enough about their bands as a family. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's in some instances, I think that's definitely definitely one of the primary factors there for sure. <laughs> in some instances, you know, it's just you know, some sometimes you have the one guy who wants to go in one direction, and the rest of the band wants to go in a, in another. Oh, direction. of course, yeah. That which is you would think they could still get along personally, but I guess just too many clashes and things like that. So, well, I, I can I, I can re I can understand that though. When you sorry to sorry to one okay, last thought on that. When you get to a point where your band is having 
massive international success. You're touring, you're making money, you're getting offers to go on and do bigger and better things. And then there's one member in the band that says, hey, I don't like the direction that we're going. I want to do something else. Yeah. But then several members of the band say, well, wait, why? We're having such great success doing what we're doing. Let's let's keep riding this train. Yeah. I could definitely see that becoming a massive source of tension in a relationship right. that could break a relationship. Right. Right. Which is interesting because with Styx, they sort of had the opposite of that. You had Dennis DeYoung who was pushing them and getting them that success. And the rest of the guys were going, we don't want to do that. So it's, we don't want that. <laughs> kind of interesting yep. because the opposite of that. We've been talking for like two hours and this has been just amazing because I feel like I'm talking to, <laughs> to an old friend that uh, that I've known for years and years and years. And it's just amazing how much uh, we're on the same page about so many things and uh, how incredible this is. And so I'm going to go on record right now saying, uh, first of all, um, I love your band. They're, you guys are amazing. And I'm, I'm going to uh, continue to cross my fingers and pray every night that we're going to get to one day do some shows together because I would love, would love uh, Emerald City Cast Live and Horizon. I think that would be just an incredible experience. Uh, would would love to make that happen. And uh, not to mention just, uh, you know, the the hanging out you know, visiting and talking like this would just be, would just be incredible. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Well, let's, let's pray that one or both of our bands gets big enough to where we can do headlining tours around the country and then the other one can join us on the tour. So well, whoever, okay. whoever gets there first, call the other. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's a deal, man. All right. Well, hey, Sounds thanks great. so much for, for all of this. Man.